There's no better way to program your subconscious mind than listening to positive statements over and over. And there's no better way to do that than in a semi-meditative alpha brainwave state. I've created three prosperity meditations on HighTimelineBooks.com to help you do just that. And for a limited time, you can get all three for the price of two. So take your life to a higher vibe. Check them all out at HighTimelineBooks.com. Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. You know, one of the miracles of astrology is there are so many varieties and ways you can do it, and they all work one way or another. And that's just a mystery and a miracle about this craft. But we have a question from a listener that is going to bring up stylistic differences in astrology, as well as how we might interpret some of these things. Hi, Thomas. Thank you for taking my question. I'm greatly enjoying the podcast. I have a question about how you balance and prioritize interpretations for placements in a birth chart that can be contradictory. So as an example of this, I have Venus in Aries in the fifth house retrograde. Uh, Part of me is thinking, well, Venus is debilitated in the sign of Aries in, in detriment. But Venus also rejoices in the fifth house. It, she is in her joy in that house. And so part of me wonders, how do I then interpret that in readings of my own chart? I'm curious to know about your thought process and method for how you interpret these quote unquote contradictions in different charts. I'm not even sure if that's the correct word, but I'd love if you could shed light a bit into that process. This is such a great question and so observant of this astrologer. Every planet has an exaltation, a sign in which it is at its best. And the sign opposite the sign of its exaltation is where it is in its fall. For example, Saturn, which rules Capricorn, Saturn is exalted in Libra. It's in its fall in Aries. Saturn in the seventh house is called accidentally dignified because it is in the natural wheel's seventh house, which corresponds to Libra. So you can have Saturn in a a sign of its fall or detriment, say Aries or Cancer. But if it's in the seventh house, it is also accidentally dignified. So this man's Venus is detrimented in Aries opposite the sign that it rules. The detriments are in the, the signs opposite. So... Venus rules Taurus, it's at its detriment in Scorpio. Venus rules Libra, so it's detrimented in Aries, as he has it. But it's in the fifth house, so it's in its joy, by house position. If you can distinguish between the planets, which represent internal energies, Venus is the archetype, the energy within our soul of love, attraction. In the solar system, it equates to the gravitational forces of attraction and repulsion. But in ourselves, Venus rules love, attraction, the arts, self-worth, because Venus is the natural second house ruler. It rules money and how we handle it. So those are the internal energies. The houses are external situations, primarily. So the planets show the disposition of our soul's energies of love or lust, which is Mars. The reason Venus is detrimented in Aries is because Aries is a Martian sign, hugely idealistic, tremendously romantic. It's one of these love at first sight kinds of configurations, but Mars rules lust, just the sheer sexual attraction between people. And Venus in Aries is detrimented because it will often mistake lust for love, and it will fall in love with people whom it may have a strong attraction sexually for, but who are totally wrong in terms of a lasting relationship. So if you think about the houses as being external situations, those are coming at us from outside of us. So that in the fifth house, this house has to do with children, both literal and figurative. 
so creative children as well as biological children. And then this man's Venus is retrograde. And among other things, and you'll read in the books, the energies of planets that are retrograde, instead of expressing directly outwardly, that person turns them inward first. So they hesitate to express those planetary energies directly. And they may turn them inward. Second of all, every retrograde planet has a significance in terms of reincarnation, rewords, retrograde. So every retrograde planet will signify a message about past lives, in this case, affecting this man's love and romance and creativity, which he has a lot of, especially mental creativity with Venus in Aries. But he doesn't trust it because of the retrograde. So his mission is to learn to do that, learn to trust his creative instincts, his creative inspiration. He has incredible intuitions about people. So if, if that begins to give you an idea of how to think about the planets in their exaltations and falls or detriments, as well as the houses where they're accidentally dignified, the houses for each planet, for example, Venus is exalted in Pisces. It is accidentally dignified, Venus is, when it is in the 12th house, which in the natural wheel is the house of Pisces. So, And you can find all of this online, but it's, I think, hugely important to know these things. Because now you're getting into some real important but subtle distinctions that the horoscope is trying to tell you about. Now, that may springboard us into some, some more discussion here, Thomas. Well, I'm thinking about styles of, of ways that people practice astrology. And some styles, more toward the Hellenistic styles, which are experiencing a renaissance, they focus greatly on this nighttime, the sect, the whole thing about that, like that's a really big part of interpretation. And then others discount it almost completely because the focus is more on the soul growth and every placement contributes to the path of our soul and it's all favorable or it gives us the hurdles and the challenges to overcome. So it's not good or bad. It's part of our journey and both work. I mean, I think both styles are incredibly beneficial. So as you've watched this over so many decades and with so many people and so many different charts, what do you see as kind of the, is the balance that like what you just described, that there is part of this that does? Yes, it is something that needs to be acknowledged. Well, in terms of the strength of the planets, there are a lot of, well, there's several considerations. First off is angularity. Is a planet in the first, fourth, seventh, or tenth? because the angles are strongest, or is a planet maybe in the ninth house, but near the 10th cusp. The nearer a planet is to or a planet being angular, the stronger it is in the chart, stronger its influence. Second strongest is in the succeeding houses, the second, the fifth, the eighth, and the 11th. The third level of strength is in the cadent houses, the third, sixth, ninth, and 12th. So there's that aspect to the strength of the planets. And then, of course, there is the sign that the planet is in, whether it's in a sign of its exaltation or fall or a sign that it rules or if it's a sign of detriment and so on. And then third are the aspects that it makes. Because you can have a planet in fall or detriment that is very beneficially aspected, say from a trine with Jupiter or Venus, which means that the person is likely, even though the planet is in its fall or detriment, they are likely to learn from their mistakes involving that planet and its cause position and so on, and grow and evolve positively through their mistakes. Whereas you can have a planet in its exaltation, but if it's negatively aspected by, say, Saturn, 
that person may repeatedly encounter mistakes despite the planet being in its exaltation the way that they express that planet will arouse competition or rejection or conflict until they become conscious of it through astrology and maybe psychology as well i hope that's not too confusing no, I think that's that's a really good basis that we should all keep in mind as we approach our chart and look at these various positions. You know, I've got Venus in Virgo. Oh, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So it's in its fall. <laughs> yeah, it's in its fall. And so is Pluto is in Virgo as well. They're not in a conjunction. They're 15 degrees apart. But that Venus is also in an inconjunct or a quincunx to Chiron in the 8th. And have I had troubles around the, the whole area represented by the third and the eighth houses uh, relative to sex, sexuality, marriage, and money as well? And OPM, I mean, that's the focus du jour with my family right now is that. So when I look at that and I think, wow, yeah, okay, I came to cross some hurdles in this life, and they have certainly presented Yep. <laughs> I can second that emotion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, is then we just kick into the realization that we are here to grow through those areas. It's fascinating. The older astrologers never did assign um, exaltations and falls and so on to Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto. The contemporary astrologers do, but um, I don't. I just stick with the Chaldean planets and their signs of exaltation and fall. But it's fascinating to, especially what this man mentioned. Uh, I don't know, but he may have Sagittarius rising if he has Venus and Aries in the fifth. He may have Sagittarius rising, which is, of course, ruled by Jupiter. And that Venus in Aries will trine his first house if that's the case. So that through Sagittarian means, he can learn to maximize his Venus in Aries. And Sagittarius has to do with higher learning, higher thought, philosophy, metaphysics, spirituality, astrology, which I consider a philosophy. And it's through those things, because Venus in Aries is basically a very immature position for love and romance. And if it's in an early degree, it's even more immature. If it's in the first decanate, the second decanate of a sign, third decanate, the third decanate is always more mature. I have my moon in three Aries, for example, very immature moon. So I've had to learn <laughs> to, to do my best to overcome the childishness of it. And if his Venus in Aries is also in a very early, and Aries as a sign, it's not so much it is immature, in a sense, but it is so concerned with self-development. And it's an intuitive sign in analytical psychology. It's a fire sign. And they are all about the self. Yes, that can look selfish to other people. It doesn't have to be because they can be incredibly generous. But what they are really all about is how far can I develop myself in this life? So it's a hugely personal experience of life with Venus in Aries. The real message is, what does it mean to truly love myself? They will tend to seek love and approval through somebody else when they're younger, through romance and marriage, and it never works until... They've truly learned to love and value themselves first. Be true to yourself. And then your relationships will also be with people who are being true to themselves. So Venus and Aries retrograding the fifth can wind up in codependent relationships until it becomes conscious about who am I? What do I love in myself? Am I developing those gifts and those interests and those talents? Even if developing them means I'm not going to get married or have children or 
Do I want to get married and have children and place those responsibilities over my own self-development? That's the quandary with that position. Over the years, you went from stumbling into a bookstore in 1965 to that kind of synthesis about not only psychology, but how astrology fits into it, to how we reconcile modern and Hellenistic, the whole package. How did you get to a point of being able to see the patterns like what you just described, of, of the, just that one particular position of Venus in Aries? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Years. Yeah. You know, I think when we all start out, Thomas, I'm a natural skeptic, but I'm also very pragmatic. And I say this to clients all the time. If astrology is so great, or metaphysics or spiritual, all these studies are so great, then they had better make me happier, healthier, wealthier, and wiser. Otherwise, what's the point? So I test everything. And the only way I, for me, I read everything I could get my hands on, and I mean everything, in metaphysics and psychology, starting with the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and on and on, Carl Jung and all of them, Adler and every psychologist I could find, every metaphysical book, but I practiced. I started, of course, with my own chart, but then reading people's charts and seeing what worked and what didn't. And over time, like we all do, I, I was as insecure as anybody starting out. But over time, you realize, ooh, this works. That mm, doesn't work so well. So you discard the things that may not mean much to you or work very well for you and hang on to the things that do. And over time, you realize, I'm getting more and more confident in what astrology really is for. The thing I love about it is you can never get bored with it. It's the only thing in my life that I've never, you can't get bored. Every chart is different. Every reading is different. And you're always learning, which, of course, I love. And so does this guy with Venus in Aries. So right there, what, so, you, what you were just talking about. So Venus in Aries in detriment, and you said that the thing that you strive for is to love yourself first. And then here's another characteristic that you just mentioned, that this guy likes to continue learning. Where did those come from? Well, Aries is a very bright sign. And the retrograde condition, and with Venus in Aries in the fifth house, it's basically learning to truly love his talents. And the key to that is Joseph Campbell's phrase, follow your bliss. Your bliss is really shown by Venus, but also at the fifth house. And that house also has to do with hobbies and avocations and talents, artistic and creative talents. And so on. they can be in scientific fields. You can certainly be creative as a scientist. But it's finding and discovering. And so one of the questions you could ask somebody like this man is, what did you want to be when you were a little boy? What did you dream about being? What were your hobbies? What did you have as a hobby or a love that you gave up on? because it didn't seem like you would ever make a career out of it. Go back to that and look at the elements of those interests that you truly loved and begin to figure out a way to make a living out of them. It's a very good aspect for being self-employed, that Venus in Aries retrograde. So that's the kind of themes that that position would show is be true to your own loves don't it it's not about look have as much fun as you want to sexually and romantically but if you're not careful those will supersede your own self-development of your own talents you can get up and get caught up in oh i'm gonna find the ideal woman and we're gonna get married and run off and live happily ever after in the palace never happens but they can go through a life, and I've, I've known people who do. They'll be 80, and, oh, my God, I'm in love. Meanwhile, they've been through four husbands, and they're estranged from their six kids. But they never develop their own talent because they've been so preoccupied with the external affection when it's really the internal, healthy, 
constructive love of what you've been given, what yourself is here for. And once you begin to do that old phrase, love thyself, you can't expect somebody to love you if you don't love yourself. All those cliches are true. And that's the message of that position. Brilliant synthesis. And it is just pulling it all together from all the different components. Well, thank you, Robert. That is fascinating. And, sir, I hope that answered your question well. I think it did. And if you'd like to learn how to do that, we have a couple of resources around here. You can find them on the funastrology.com website. We have a 101 course. If you just need to learn how to speak the language and you want a completely self-paced course, the 101 course will get you fluent to where at least you can know what ground you're on and you can start to synthesize. Then, if you're in an intermediate level and you really want to take it up, we have our horary course, which is Robert's specialty. It's kind of his signature course, and that has so much information, particularly on things like the houses. goes in incredible depth on Mark Edmund Jones' material, synthesized into Robert's material, synthesized into how do you put it together to consider timing and yes-no questions and answers to things and being able to navigate around the chart. What house rules this particular situation? And also the consultation chart is in there, which is brilliant in and of itself. So we have a lot of resources that can help you get from beginner to basically master right there just in those two courses. So I hope you'll check that out. And if you'd like to leave a message like this guy did, Go to the top of Fun Astrology, and the upper left is an orange button, and you just hit that, and you can leave it anonymously. You don't even have to leave an email. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock.